This animation for MSI was a chance for me to practice immersive cinematic storytelling. My name is Howard Wimshurst, and this video will take you behind the scenes for how we made this animation, as well as some technical and philosophical advice to filmmakers. First, let's talk about the client, MSI. MSI specializes in computers for digital content creators, and they built this on their decade-long pioneering technology in the gaming space. So they've transitioned from creating computer technology for gamers to content creators, which suits me very well. The MSI Creator Award honors the most creative and outstanding creators from all around the world. And the award consists of three categories, graphic design, 3D creation, and film. And because they're a PC brand, they are offering some state-of-the-art tech for their prize winners. So MSI actually sent me a Creator PC for me to try out for myself. 64 gigabytes of RAM, an Intel i9 11th gen processor. I mean, this thing packs some power into it and inside a very small body. I love the design, very unique design. Just the PC design in itself was the inspiration for this animation. If you enter and win, the film category of the MSI Creator Awards, there are some really nice prizes on the line for you to win. Remember that if you want to submit to the film category, you have until May the 30th to get your entries in. And the link to all the information you will need will be in the description of this video. As many of you will know, I had to step away from hosting the Animator Guild annual film contest this year. So I'm really happy that MSI is stepping up and providing these opportunities to up and coming filmmakers. When Sport5 contacted me about the opportunity to work with MSI, I saw this as an opportunity to practice my creative storytelling abilities as an animation director and producer. The first step of production was to find an animator who could work with me on this. I had noticed one animator who was consistently showing up for the Animator Guild monthly community challenges on our community Discord group and uh, was creating some really nice entries. But the most important thing I identified was her strong storyboarding skills. To keep this a small production, I wanted someone who was capable of working end to end in the animation pipeline. The fact that she could storyboard and color as well as animate made her my first choice. So when I contacted Isabel, she was quite busy at the time with her own things going on. So she said, let me take a couple of days to think about it. And after a few days, she said yes, and we got to work. But I had to first come up with a story. The creator PC itself was the spark that ignited my imagination with the story. It started with looking at the construction of the creator PC and seeing these uh, tiny little people occupying the PC and uh, inhabiting the PC. I thought that was a fun idea. The idea developed into uh, the PC being this massive towering structure, like this obelisk in a desert environment almost like a piece of alien technology, like the Sentinel in uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. The PC would then be revealed to be at this gateway to a new world, a new utopia, which is the theme of the uh, Creator Awards this year. At first I was thinking we're, we're going to actually show what's on the other side of this uh, gateway. And then I actually decided it would be better to remain ambiguous. It's your world inside there. And I shouldn't tell you what that world looks like. Instead, I'm going to work on building anticipation for what's inside. And then it's up to you what is on that other side of that gateway. It took a few iterations to get the story right. And I found that that was my principal role as the director was to focus down, to narrow all of the possibilities of what this story could be and to create this really focused story that had a central theme, a central idea and to not veer off of that. I also found that my role as a director was about controlling the information and when the information was released to the audience. So, um, starting off with certain information about the film in the first shot. 
establishing things even before the first shot, coming in with the sound first, the sounds of the desert. So we're releasing information bit by bit. We hadn't yet shown in the first shot the creator PC. That comes later in a later shot, you see? So we're controlling the information. That is one of the roles of the director. Being the director is one half of it, and then being the producer is the other half. So the producer is more concerned with the logistics of the animation, uh, getting the animation made within the deadline, deciding how much runtime was necessary to tell the story versus how much runtime we could actually realistically use for this animation and a bunch of other different logistical things. How many shots was it going to take up and what the production pipeline was going to be, what software was going to be involved, how to transfer files and, and maintain communication throughout. So these are the kind of jobs that as a director and a producer, I was involved with in the animation. Now, as the actual foot soldier who was doing the nitty gritty, creating the storyboards and then the frame by frame animation, I tried to leave that as much as I could to Isabel. So that was Isabel's main uh, job. So she was really the force that was moving this project uh, in the technical aspect of it. So Isabel was actually the one drawing the whole thing. It was really nice to work with Isabel on this because I just let her get on with it. She produced a lot of imaginative ideas and iterations, which we were then able to narrow down and focus into the story through her screen recordings, we're able to see her process in action. Let's bring Isabel into the conversation now, AKA Sketch Away, and she can tell us more about the process and her background and her experience in storyboarding and 2D animation. Let me remove my messy page. One second. <laughs> Don't move the easel in the background. I like that. <laughs> it's cool. Yeah, that's my token, token artist easel. <laughs> I think maybe let's start from the beginning. How did you get into animation and become a storyboarder. I'm curious to know. Uh, I guess I'm just going to start with my life story. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I've been an artist, uh, I think, ever since grade school. And I started doing mangas. I was really in love with like De Detective Conan and Inuyasha. So I always knew I wanted to be an artist. And yeah, soon I realized that being a mangaka, especially in Germany, is not something that's very lucrative or something that's gonna earn you money. So uh, actually my uncle or my mother's cousin, uh, when I was around 16, he was working at Warner Brothers as a storyboard artist. Uh, and he later became an animation director. So I visited the States with my mom and I was able to shadow him at his workspace for two weeks. And yeah, I, <laughs> I got to know the storyboarding life and his colleagues, everything was so down to earth. and. I loved that actually there is uh, like handwork or labor that goes into animation because I always thought it's just basically done with like the click of a mouse button but suddenly <laughs> there's just an animation there and I loved the idea that actually there's a whole process of creative people and yeah ever since then so I was 16 at that point and then I went back home to Germany and I knew I have to be somebody somehow in that industry when I grow up so I think in that case, I have kind of an advantage uh, amongst other people because I knew from quite an early age uh, where I want to focus. And then my parents were really generous and let me study in Glendale, California from, I think it was 18 until I was 21. All right. Or 22, yeah. And so I met with my uncle, he gave me lots of advice. I took courses there. And then I was too scared to apply for any jobs after I was studying because I didn't really feel confident in my skill. So I went back home to Germany because living abroad and studying abroad was so expensive. Without a plan, I decided to study again in Germany. And that's when I went to the University of Applied Sciences in Darmstadt. And that's actually where I started animating. Before that, I only wanted to be a storyboard artist because I liked how much uh, you can affect a whole movie instead of just working on one single shot. I always felt like animation was kind of tedious and I, I wasn't good at it, so I never tried it until I studied in Germany. And then I realized, since I was forced to do it, actually it's so much fun. <laughs> and I, I really enjoyed that you could basically, I don't know, it's, it's like magic to me where you just have to draw something and then suddenly it's there and moving. 
and has personality. So yeah, I totally fell in love with it to the point where when I was finished with studying, I didn't know if I wanted to do animation or storyboarding. So I <laughs> did something that's probably not so good. I just applied to companies and said, hey, I do storyboards and animation. Uh, just take your pick, basically. <laughs> I just want to work with you, but nothing worked. I actually sent out, I think, 50 different applications and I got nothing, not one callback, no interview. Yeah. So I thought maybe that's not the path that I'm supposed to be on and I started freelancing. Yeah, I started storyboarding because I had more experience there and I felt a bit more confident rather than with my animation skills. And from there, everything developed. Yeah, so it wasn't fully intentional for me to end up where I'm right now, but actually I really like that I'm my own boss and I pick my own clients. You probably feel the same way. Oh yeah, for sure, yeah. There's... Similar kind of circumstances led me to where I am. Where it's difficult doing an outreach. It felt like trying to convince someone that they need something, that maybe they do, maybe they don't. And it's nine times out of 10, you're going to be asking them at the wrong time when they don't actually need another animator or something. Yeah, totally. And I'm from a small town and uh, I'm not sure what it's like in the UK, but in Germany we have an agency that helps you find, find a job. When you're unemployed okay. and when you're a student at um, high school, then you're supposed to go there and have meetings and have kind of an orientation. And I told them I'm an artist and they, <laughs> they suggested to me that I could become a painter of walls. I'm not sure what you call that in English, but not like an artistic painter, but like painting buildings. With basically. a roller, just roll yeah. Maybe yeah. I would have been good at it, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely super grateful that I have a few connections and my parents also were really encouraging with having me kind of discover that world. Yeah. And yeah, I'm really, really happy I ended up here where I am right now. What exactly were you doing or where were you when this project came along? No, I was re actually really so surprised to see your message in my inbox and uh, I had checked Discord a few days prior because I think I only got back to you like five days or something after you had written me the request. And I had seen something in my inbox, but I just thought it's an animator guild, just like a general notification. Right. Like, and then sometimes I thought, wait, is that actually Howard writing me? <laughs> Damn, I should have checked Discord more often. But uh, yeah, I was at the finishing stretch of a really long period of lots of work, do lots of jobs as much as I can do. And then I also had to basically design a course for uh, students, which I forgot to mention. I also teach at the oh, nice. university I studied at in Germany. Um, so I had to prepare a course for them and think about the you know, how am I going to structure it? What's going to go in there? I had to design all the slides and the assignments. So it was just lots of work. And I was doing that next to my other like 50 hour a week job. So I was really tired and I thought, yeah, in January, February, I'm going to take a vacation. Oh, no. <laughs> and then I got your message and I thought, wow, my vacation can wait. I have to take this job. <laughs> I thought it could be a really great opportunity to um, work with you because I've always loved the animation, also the knowledge you get on YouTube and your animations are so dynamic. And then also working for MSI, of course, since I previously had mostly done work for uh, smaller projects and lots of independent films. I really uh, was very interested in the idea of working for a larger client. So yeah. I, I really had to push my vacation <laughs> to the back of <laughs> Well, we're all thankful that you did. And from my point of view, I saw that you were making so many really top quality entries in the Animator Guild monthly challenges. The time frame for one of them is, is a month. So mm -hmm. along comes this project, the time frame is about a month. It's a short project, kind of like what you've already been making. So I was like, this is perfect. Mm -hmm. It's like. Would you like to do what you have been doing and get paid for it? <laughs> so yeah. hopefully you're resting now and just taking a break because it sounds like it has a lot of work that you've been putting in. You know, every now and again, it feels good to take like a total break. And yeah. then after a year or two, when you come back, you're like really hungry to create more art. And I always find that I'm a lot better after I have basically forced myself to stay away from art totally. Mm. Okay, yeah, it's, it's different for different people, but that sounds like good advice for a lot of people who have uh, just worked themselves a bit too much. Mm -hmm. 
So maybe starting with the designs that you did for this character, um, which I loved. As soon as you sent these through, I was like, oh my gosh. I didn't even think of doing that, like some of these designs. And it kind of goes to show your your background in storyboarding and the, and the pre-production. What was your thought process with this when, when I said like, well, we better start with some designs? I don't have like an established workflow when it comes to those full projects, because as a storyboarder, you know, I'm used to being given a script and a lookbook and character designs. Mm or um, headshots of actors. Uh, but this time, to be honest, I just went straight into it because I'm quite visual with my ideation. So I always, I don't really think that much. I just draw. And yeah. then while I'm drawing, I correct stuff. Uh, one thing that I always do in front of projects is mood boards. You also right. sent me over a bunch of references and then I went on a couple hours of Google search, just finding all types of references for environments, accessories, clothing, body language, uh, light and color, which is something that I struggle with, which I told you in the beginning, like that's something <laughs> where I, I may need your support. By pulling in images from the internet, you can get a very quick, broad view of like, okay, that's what he means by that. That's what he's thinking of. Because we're all informed by things that we see, whether it's on the internet or in movies, photographs. Yeah, one thing especially where the mood boards helped as well was uh, the sense of scaling, which you also mentioned. Um, I think before we did the mood boards or before I did the mood boards, you um, were looking through my first version of the storyboard and you already said like it could be way more cinematic, like first of all, ultra wide screen and then just make the character so like tiny compared to those huge dunes or rocks, allowing myself to totally exaggerate scale, yes. which is I oftentimes don't do because I do a lot of dramas and kids shows so it's, right. it's um, more based and grounded so yeah I, I gave myself those references to allow and remind myself to really um, freak out a little bit yes with the thing. also with the color which the color really was uh, in my opinion very freaky <laughs> the first time around <laughs> it was very very red it took some while for me to uh later tone that down and find a color that i felt looked realistic or believable yeah coming back to the character i really can't say that i put too much thought into the design um, maybe it was a lucky happening that it just kind of flowed out of my my pen yeah the intuition yeah yeah I used one of the pieces that you sent me over as reference where the character is wearing like this pretty dark eyeliner with a very intricate cloth. I really felt like that brought a certain mood across. So I just tried to capture the, the feeling and that kind of mysterious traveler uh, yes. vibe. Illustration by Sergio Toppi, I think, who is an yeah. Italian comic book artist. Like you said, it has that mysteriousness had like the the whole detail with uh, different patterns, different um, fabrics. It made them look really rich, like as if they had experienced a ton. Yes, yeah, like they've collected these trinkets and jewelry from many places that they've visited. I think we should show people some storyboards that didn't make it in. Um, mm -hmm. So we had a dragon at one point. So this character is walking through this desert landscape with these sandstone structures that one of them there's a dragon on a rock and another one the dra the dragon opens his eye and it's just this massive eye we ended up moving away from that idea on the topic of the creator pc we had this shot that was like moving around the creator pc quite a precise angle and a nuanced angle and you used after effects for that it was relatively easy to uh, create that camera move but tweaking it was kind of difficult because you're not really there so you have to kind of emulate a natural feeling of the camera and i have never really worked with a filming camera professionally professionally before so i didn't really know how is it supposed to feel so uh yeah it, it took a bunch of tweaking yeah, your finishing touches basically, because you also probably have a ton more experience in post-production. <laughs> I think that really elevated the entire sequence. This shot and the one where the light beam travels up. 
you actually did a quite big change and I thought wow oh my god you can do that out of the, <laughs> out of the shot that I gave you like I didn't even think about certain uh, stylistic devices that you use the the benefits of working in a partnership is that when one artist has thought of everything they can think of they reach their limits but then as soon as you show it to another artist they get other ideas of their own and they kind of build on top of each other we witnessed that in this project i think in that case we really uh we matched up pretty well because you have those strengths where i lack (laughs) experience (laughs) what was your favorite shot to animate I'm not sure if I can say a whole shot was my favorite. I definitely really enjoyed animating the sun in the Mm. first shot. And one of the reasons why I enjoyed it so much was that it felt so easy and natural to draw it. Like the the version that we have right now is the first draft. Yeah, it's just the first draft. (laughs) Yeah, it it just came really easily. And I also really enjoyed animating cloth. I had never had too much experience with that, but putting the cloth over the walking feet or yeah, uh, yeah. over the figure when the door is open and there's this blast of wind and the yeah. cloth goes kind of crazy in the wide shot. That was so much fun. And also just because I learned a lot during it and you you can go a little bit crazy. You know, you don't have to be too conservative when there's like a gust of wind coming out. You can really have the cloth react quite intensely to that. I really enjoyed that very, very much. Yeah, and for the the sunshot, I remember sending you some footage of this uh, sunset. Yeah, I think my my favorite shot was probably just the eyes, when you can mm-hmm. see the face, and then the clothes start to start to pick up and start to move. But just having the blue eyes with the uh, markings on that mm-hmm. uh, that to me was really quite a special shot even though we were sort of debating it and whether we needed it in there when like how much we should show of the character because we wanted to keep the mystery so it was a bit of a tricky shot but I think in the end it's it just ended up being like locking eyes with that character and yeah I also think it probably would have been a mistake to take it out um, because obviously it's not totally necessary content wise but eyes are just drawn to eyes or we are drawn yeah. to looking at faces so yeah. i think uh, you you may risk taking away some of the uh, i guess memorability if that's the correct word yeah if you take away that connection of looking face to face into a character because you only see them otherwise in wide shots and the feet yeah. which makes you distant to the character yeah uh, yeah I, I also I enjoyed doing that shot very much, and especially the colors when I added the light in the end. Uh, I really felt like it came together. Yeah, it's a bit of a challenge to edit animation, especially when you're presented with all of these possibilities, and they all seem like really good possibilities, really interesting possibilities, but. You have to kind of be ruthless with your edit. But then in this case, I, that was the one where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm ruthless in this edit, but I'm showing mercy to this shot because I think there is something special in there. It's a tricky process, but it's one of the reasons that we were able to actually get the whole short film finished within a reasonable time. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's something that I think every filmmaker has to has to learn at some point. Um, One of the ways I saw it um, in in earlier films that I'd made, which has helped me here, is like thinking of it as like a highlight reel. So Mm -hmm. if you weren't making the whole film, but you were making a highlight reel of the film with the best moments, or you were making a trailer for the film that you want to make, how would you shoot that? How would you cut it Mm -hmm. into different segments? So that's one of the ways that I was selecting the shots uh, because we didn't have a lot of time to make it. Yeah, that's true. I think that's that's a good way to look at it. I feel like some a little bit of variation that having that close-up shot in, um, next to all of those walking, walking, walking shots, I think that's a good thing because otherwise it, you can risk becoming kind of boring or having mm. the film be a little boring. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, and I also think it's always easier to go to one extreme first, cut it super short and see how much you actually need to tell the story in a way that is understandable to any objective viewer. Mm. And then you can always add more. If you end up having more time, um, yeah, it's easier to add. Absolutely. 
Do you have any general advice that you think could help a newcomer to this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are several pieces and one of them is quite practical and that is take care of your body. Make sure you don't overwork yourself. I think as artists, we are very, very prone to uh, becoming workaholics because our job is very much fun to us. But um, yeah, I have injured my elbow, my wrist from drawing over the course of my studies. So uh, one very practical advice is if you're working with a pen, don't grip it too tightly. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's as basic as that. Just try and keep your muscles relaxed. For post-production or people who work with mice, I use a vertical mouse which really oh, helps cool. with my and yeah those are two super basic fixes that you can incorporate into your routine very easily and then I guess a bit more philosophical <laughs> advice uh, would be to uh, don't focus on perfection I am very passionate about perfectionism and in that I feel like in many many cases it's just procrastination mm. It's procrastination that's wearing a pretty coat, <laughs> a pretty yeah. disguise. It feels productive. Uh, if you're like planning and planning or rolling ideas around in your head, but if you're actually not doing the thing, not drawing, not modeling, whatever, then you're wasting, well, you're not wasting your time, but you are probably wasting opportunities. Yeah. So yeah, honestly, just start. I think that's the best advice. And you don't have to be perfect in your skills before you start. Just start and then you can learn while you're doing it. For me, I always feel like, oh, I have to still learn how to draw feet and I'm not that good at drawing in perspective yet or I don't really understand elbows and hand drawings. Well, then you learn it on the job or as yes. you're on the road. Start before you're ready. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think those are the, the most important parts. Loosen your muscles and loosen your mind. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I think that's such great advice. Thank you again. I don't think this project would have been nearly as good <laughs> if uh, if we didn't uh, come together to, to work on this collaboratively. And, and also it was a lot more fun than just working solos. Yeah, definitely. No, I mean, working with you has been so much fun and I always got very excited when I saw you. I had a like a feedback email from you because you're really enthusiastic in the way you communicate because some of my other clients, it's like very corporate and very dry, <laughs> but I kind of, I, I really enjoyed that uh, to see that you were enjoying what I was producing. Oh, so much. See, I love having like an artist like send me cool stuff that they've been making. Like this is the best <laughs> job. I can't think of a better job for me. And so mm -hmm. my policy is like when I'm excited about an animation, I don't try to hide it. I just let the artist know, hey, I'm really stoked about this. This is great. Yeah. yeah. That was so refreshing to me. And I can also just return that when I got your uh, the TV paint file that you reworked, uh, especially yeah. that animating the hand touching the sign or touching the surface of the PC. For me, I felt like, oh, there's something missing. Like it feels kind of stiff. Uh, so I sent it over to you. And when I got it back, you had included this kind of rotation of the hand. And it felt all of a sudden the hand had character. <laughs> and it had value or something or the, the person is searching or kind of feeling uh, instead of just kind of robotically or mechanically placing the hand onto yeah. the PC. And yeah, no, I've also found it really exciting with how many like subtle tweaks you can really elevate the quality very intensely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is kind of the I decided to make a bit of a performance out of the hand. I was just thinking like, how can I build mystery? And a small difference like the, the rotation of the hand can just say like, instead of him knowing straight away where it is, he has to search for it a little bit. Thank you so much for um, agreeing to do this. Yeah, it's been great. Bye. Bye. Now that the visuals were locked in, it came back to me to produce the one missing element, the essential missing element of this animation, which was the soundtrack. 
So this was something that I was really looking forward to. It's also a very important part of it to create an audio visual experience. I started by finding sound effects of the environment, imagining for myself what kind of sounds I would hear in this kind of alien desert landscape and this nomad traveling through. So I was looking up sounds of sand that was sweeping across a vast landscape. I was thinking of the wind that was carrying that sand and the dust and also the sounds of fabric and maybe the occasional clinking of some kind of trinket on this nomad. So, so I was using my imagination and the visuals were a great help for that. I was looking at the visuals and thinking of what sounds the visuals would produce. Some of the sounds were just made by me as well, like the sound of the stick hitting the floor, that was just uh, the kind of, just a dull thump on my hand. Then after the sound effects and Foley, I created the music soundtrack uh, itself and I created the whole thing from scratch. I made a few attempts at a chord progression before settling on one that I was happy with. Uh, most of this process for coming up with the chords and the notes it's quite an intuitive process. It's just like messing around on the guitar neck or on the keyboard and then just identifying something that sounds kind of right for the occasion. All I knew going into it is that I didn't really want the progression to go down as it went on. I wanted the progression to either stay flat and level like the landscape of the desert or to rise a little bit in anticipation for this gateway opening. Okay, I'm in Mixcraft now, starting with the guitar. So it opens up with just the guitar and the bass. So this is what the guitar sounds like without effects on it. Really simple, just like some power chords. Then we match that with the finger bass. This is VST instruments. Uh, just to give it a more full sound. Now, here I've added on some compression and an amp simulator to the acoustic guitar. Just roughens the sound up a little bit, makes it sound a little bit more rugged. Now, th there's this track by Portishead called Rhodes, and uh, there's this sound effect that they have on the guitar, and it sounds a bit like I didn't know what the name of that sound effect was, but I thought it would be really good to have that sound uh, in this soundtrack. So it was a bit difficult of, of a challenge because I didn't know the name of this effect and I had to somehow find it. So I did a lot of Google searches trying to find the name of this effect and I eventually found it. I found that it's called a modulator, which to some people who work in music full time, that's probably a really obvious thing, but I just didn't know what the name of that was. This is where I've put the modulator. We're using a WOV modulator and this is what that sounds like. So it's really going up and down, there's peaks involved. And to me, that modulator sound sounded a lot like the mirage that you would see across the desert, the feeling of heat, pulsing heat from the sun. Yeah, I really liked that sound effect and I'm glad I was able to find it. Leading up to the next part, we've got some strings. This is what they sound like individually. So just individual notes and I brought them together. So together they sound like... So quite a nice build into the next part where we have more guitar and the vocals. So these are my vocals and I've shifted them to the right and left of the uh, tracks so that it sounds like a more spread out sound. If I just solo these two, it sounds like they're occupying the outer channels of the headphones, spread out really wide.
And the effects on that, I've got um, I've got EQ, compression, and reverb. So just the basics, but uh, very wet. If I bring in the other two, this is where I pitched my own vocal up by an octave, re-recorded the sound so it's slightly different from the other ones, and added an M auto pitch VST, and brought the formant shift down by 12. So that sounds like this. So it just adds a different level onto this small choir. This alpha sampler, I just recorded myself doing some harmonic sounds on the acoustic guitar. They sound... Yeah, they sound a bit more like bells than uh, actual strings, which I really like the sound of harmonics on the guitar. And then if I unsolo them, you can hear everything else. So a pretty simple soundtrack, pretty stripped down, but I felt like that was all that was necessary. So that's what I had going on in Mixcraft. So if I think back in my time uh, animating, making animations, the thing that really just lit a fire in me was competitions. Just these little animation competitions with a theme. There's something about that challenge that really just ignited the inspiration in me. So if any of you guys watching, if you have been struggling with creativity, struggling with the drive to get up and make an animation and to finish an animation, I think there's no better way of doing that than competing in an online competition. This is what I did many times on my way to becoming professional in animation. And even now I definitely consider joining in on these uh, contests. So I'm really glad that MSI is taking up the torch with this one. There are these opportunities for animators to come from anywhere, anywhere in the world, and prove that they have what it takes to make amazing animations. And it's also a great experience to come together in the end and watch all of these entries and to just enjoy them. Uh, it's a really nice event that they're putting on. So, so I hope that some of you consider entering into this contest and I hope that some of you also consider watching the contest when it's available online. Once again, thank you to MSI for supporting creatives all over the world. Make sure to check out the details of the MSI awards and I look forward to judging your entry. So thank you for watching. I hope you learned something. Goodbye, good luck, and I look forward to seeing your entries.